Now, um, Dr. Ghani, I want to come back to you. Um, you said as something which is really important. If you want to change perceptions and who governs education, in your country in particular, you have competing interests. And the way education is governed is often by the person who actually controls power. How do you change perceptions there? How do you deal with an issue like that? And Afghanistan is one example. We have it in the Balkans, we have it in Sri Lanka, we have it in several African countries when you have a perception of the other. And in your case, you have several different competing identities within Afghanistan. Sure. I mean, let me get illustrate. When I became Chancellor of Kabul University, I spent four months talking to the 10,000 students, asking them to identify the five key issues that were priority. And dialogue is fundamental to this. You cannot have citizenship without a sense of a conversation. And that conversation has to be structured. Uh, before I came in, students literally were killing each other in de broad daylight. Within two months, three months, as a result of this conversation, security was self-reproduced. Uh, so it's important. Second, the question of identity is multiple. If you start insisting on a single identity, you're never going to resolve it. What we need to appreciate is, in the Middle East, in larger uh, South Asia, we don't have a single identity, we have situational identities in plural. And the European notion of identity is a lot more as a product of nation state single. Imposition of this type of identity on that type of plural fluid situation is problematic. So as a result, you need to acknowledge. And a lot of struggles over identity are about the invention of the past. You mentioned Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a classic case where a past was invented in order to rob the future, and, and it resulted. So these things matter, and we need to be facilitating, and it requires the patience to reach understanding with all the stakeholders regarding how universities are governed. That's exactly the point. I mean, I think Europe is also grappling with the concept of multiple identities, and we see that also in the Balkans. Now, one of the things that you said is when there is foreign intervention, there's often that uh, foreign donors fail to understand adequately the complexity of uh, um, areas in conflict. And I'll put that question to you, Francois. Now, you work for, uh, for a multilateral organization. Do you actually focus that when you move into a country which is in conflict, that there has to be adequate recognition that education is not a neutral field, that education is also a contested field, and that the kind of programs you design for these regions take that into account for them to be effective? Well, uh, in, in this report I participated in, uh, we highlight the, the perils associated with uh, distorted aid agendas in which countries which were at the same time part of a conflict were also providing aid and were mixing their development aid, so building schools, hospitals and all that, with their military interventions. So um, in, in the last decade or so, uh, countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan or uh, Iraq received a very large share of uh, official development assistance worldwide, including to education. Meanwhile, other countries in conflict were being neglected, mostly uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And in, so in these countries, um, there was a clear um, perversion of aid uh, by uh, its, uh, I mean, the, the interlinkages between the provision of, of aid and uh, of uh, military intervention. But I guess uh, Dr. Ghani has um, much more to say about this than I can. Natiri, I want to ask you, you've been working very closely with this organization, Civicus, and the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. We talked about historical memory. Historical memory is a very important instrument which is used by competing interests uh, to kind of uh, influence developments in education in their country. Your country has a very difficult past. How is Cambodia coping with coming to terms with its past and actually providing neutral education? We're not coping very well. It's very much, um, we're very much in angst. <laughs> um, education, as I mentioned earlier, was a target of politics, and to this day, education is an extremely politicized. General education um, is politicized in this manner in that the teachers are paid $50 a month. 
you can't live on $50 a month. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. You cannot live on $50 a month. And, um, and the government refuse, uh, has, uh, con continues to refuse to, to address the financial, or the, the salaries of the teachers. So that's the general um, and politicization of education. But I want to focus on the unique situation in Cambodia right now, and that we have this um, Khmer Rouge Tribunal, which is a mixed Inter uh, a mixed um, international um, court that is um, attempting to try the crimes of 35 years ago, the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. And um, the importance of this Khmer Rouge tribunal is that it, it can be a very powerful catalyst for education, for peace building, for peace education. Um, and we see the opportunities, um, but then there are a lot of associate risks with that in the po and politicization of it in that our current leaders will form a Khmer Rouge. So our government, the prime minister, the minister of finance, the minister of um, foreign affairs, the, the uh, minister of defense, and um, so on, will form a Khmer Rouge soldiers. So it's the Khmer Rouge attempting to try the Khmer Rouge through this Khmer Rouge tribunal. So you can imagine the vested interests of these politicians to rewrite history, to, and to, to have certain information in the textbook. Um, and in writing, rewriting history, um, they get to whitewash their own history, and in the process, be known by the world as the triers of the Khmer Rouge. So this is one uh, very real example of the politicization of education. Generally speaking, but through this very powerful forum that is the international, uh, that is the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. And we're doing this now, and the government is getting away with it because the UN is legitimizing the process. The UN is, is a complete sham in my eyes. International law, not only international aid, but international law needs to be um, reformed. Because at that point, let me. But that's uh, a Dr. different um, issue. Topic I know altogether. that. I mean, see, this just explains from what Harry is saying. Just the challenges facing something which is as basic as education. Mihaila, I want to draw on your experience. Now, we talked about textbooks. We've talked about curricula in school. We've talked about teachers. How important you deal with education reform? How important is it to actually focus on capacity building, and again make sure that it actually fits the context where it's being uh, brought about? It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting question indeed, because you see in countries that has just emerged from conflict, we're not only talking about aid dependency in terms of money. We're talking also about dependency in terms of intellectual capacity. We're talking about dependency in terms of expertise. So what happens is these countries count on external help for almost everything. And the point in time where a country should emancipate itself from the external assistance in terms of knowledge. Money is a different issue. This will run for a long time. Even some countries in the European Union are still classified as aid recipients, so money is not wrong, but the intellectual dependency from the external side, this is a big problem. So many countries have the problem, they slip into this vicious circle of depending on external uh, support in intellectual terms for designing their reforms and for everything. Um, you know, the OECD is all about numbers, so I'm always afraid that when I go to a forum, I'll be asked about to provide numbers. And, you know, <laughs> we work in many different areas, but we don't work on all of them. So I borrowed some of the numbers from my colleagues from UNESCO. I just wanted to read you some of them and tell you what I think is a very important issue that is still not being addressed very successfully. So some of the numbers I have, and I'm sure you have more up-to-date data on this, but is that, uh, you know, in around 80 countries, more than 80 countries, children live in places where there are landmines that are unexploded. Um, also, over 27 million children are refugees and internally displayed. They have no access to formal education. Um, also, talking about economic crisis, there are 1.2 million children trafficked annually for sex and labor, for economic reasons. Talking about health crisis, there are more than 13.2 million children worldwide who have lost one or maybe two parents on AIDS, and 80% of these live in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in many cases, you know, health problems and AIDS affect also the supply of teachers. So they're also lacking, staff lacking that works in the system. Why I'm telling you this is that, you know, 
the Bretton Woods institutions like the International Bank for Construction and Development, they were founded a long time ago. Still, if you talk about crisis interventions, aid is not a standard measure in the crisis intervention package. Right. Even if it is, you have a whole variety of different standards and norms. So it's not very clear, even if you say, well, we agree that education is part of a standard package for interventions for help in crisis situations, we don't really know what exactly we're talking about. That's exactly one of the problems, I think, about education in crisis zones. It is actually a very complex uh, um, issue, and also it has its own contradictions and dilemmas which is what I think um, there's a lot more research needs on that, and therefore we're very happy that uh, uh, Conrad Chetta is working on that. At this point, I want to ask Jana uh, if you have any comments. Uh, has the audience joined the conversation? Yes, they have. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Tell us. Um, first, they are very happy about this panel because we have so many different international perspectives, so they're really appreciated of that. And uh, especially quoted Dr. Ghani from Afghanistan. I think that's a very interesting point for them because Afghanistan than is such a special example where a lot of donors are involved. Now, um, there's one question uh, I would like to pick out, which is, what is the first thing that should be taught in conflict regions? Shouldn't the job be taken over by locals instead of supranational organizations? Right, and that's a very interesting question. We've talked something uh, in a bit about the vicious dependency on foreign aid. At this point, I would like to mention to you uh, a statistic which really shocked me, that only 2% of the humanitarian aid which goes into crisis areas is spent on education, 2%. Um, so, I mean, uh, having said that, uh, Dr. Ghani, you're the best person to talk about this. Should education be in the hands of local people? I think that's a false distinction. What we have to avoid is false nationalism. Education is a universal issue. We need to join hands to rethink it, because one, what education in the United States or Europe is today is not a stable category. It is fundamentally changing. And if we leave it just being local, then the question becomes repetition. So we need to join forces. But the second is, let's drop the dogma. You know, the Millennium Development Goal, which is laudable in itself, has done tremendous amount of damage to higher education. Because in the name of educating primary students, we've been denying tertiary education. When I was finance minister in Afghanistan, all the UN and the World Bank joined, saying no money uh, for higher education. I mean, this is ridiculous, beyond ridiculous. Uh, I'm all for primary education, but the second issue becomes, what does it end with? Not statistics. What we are, and, and for instance, in Afghanistan, we have put eight million children in school, but I think the majority of them are illiterate in three languages. So quality is going to become extremely important in this regard. This brings us to design. What, the longer a conflict is persisted, the more decimated human capital is become. So we need to understand what are the capabilities that are required? Because when we come to capacity building, capacity building is oversold. Because a lot of it is privatized, and the privatized organizations and UN agencies that are in search of budgets are actually part of the problem. Uh, so what I would look for are consortia of universities, consortia of volunteers. We need to think about very new ways of connecting. For instance, any high school student uh, who's capable in OECD countries could be paired now. In Afghanistan, we have 18 million phones now, out of a population of, of 30 million. So new ways of connecting, engaging, then I think one has a very different enterprise than just saying it's local or other. Because last point, uh, again, building on Terry. Teachers are the least paid people in these places. So we need to really come to put priorities right. How do we entrust the teaching of the next generation to those who are impoverished most? And what are the mechanisms to ensure that some sort of priorities are established? Now, talking about connectivity and bringing people together, Daryl, in your university, you actually do send students out to areas of conflict? Well, not, uh, not areas of ongoing conflict, but areas of, uh, of recent conflict. Yeah, that's not unusual at all. So we've had students uh, 
uh, doing projects in uh, that that area between that's contested between Israel and Palestine. We've had students doing projects in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, water projects, education projects. Ours is a these are vast problems, and our focus is always on individuals. You know, this student uh, connecting with this family, uh, these two students from two, two different parts of the world cooperating to try to address a problem. It's a very, it's a volunteer, it, you know, the focus is on volunteerism, one at a timeism, uh, focusing on, on individuals and the difference that individuals can make. Uh, the problems in the world are vast, as, as we're hearing about, but we feel as though our best. Our best effort is in trying to connect individuals. It goes back to the comment I think Dr. Vestavelli made yesterday about the, or was it the day before, about the, about the power of those connections that we can make that will play out over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. It's a hopeful approach. But it is obviously a, a, an approach which can be immensely successful. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Mihailo, I mean, a lot of people in areas of crisis and the most vulnerable are women and young children. Do you think the response in crisis zones, in education, should be gender responsive? This is a very tough question. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why I didn't ask you, Terry. I knew what your response would be. I want to know from an international agency that um, uh, whether there has to be specific focus. Women, in any case, uh, girls, students don't get opportunities. And in terms of crisis, research shows that they get even less opportunities. But, uh, you know, at the same time, one needs to make a distinction. Whether, I mean, education can certainly solve many issues, and it's the answer to many queries. And very often, it's an answer to queries that we... You know, kind of, it's a token answer. So in a way, I don't know when you talk about crisis situations and the fact that uh, women and girls are usually the ones that suffer most, whether we're actually talking about education or other issues here. So I would not burden the you know, educational intervention with too many tasks, but yes, the answer would be yes. What would be much more important is after you have put together your package of initial measures, is to actually track what really happens in the system with with, with the girls, for example, because it's not enough to have just these initial steps and help, but you know, it's kind of important to, to, to ensure that the system continues to be open and the gender balance is right and, and so on and so on. So it's more of a, of a, of a long-term task. Um, if I may give a very short answer to your excellent question, what one needs to start with. Um, I've worked in a project um, in former Yugoslavia in the beginning, right after the, the conflicts ended, and I very much like what you said about communication. I'm not sure whether the universities are the only place where one should communicate, so we worked with a lot with children from region, cities, and village that used to be until yesterday, so to speak, in a conflict. And these were places where schools were turned overnight into incubators of hate and hate speech. So I think if you would choose one thing to start with, and it's very easy to say, it's very difficult to do, I think, mm -hmm. is to start eradicating hate. It starts with the teachers, goes over the parents, to end up with the students. So this, I think, would be, you know, it's no, very difficult to quantify, but yeah, in it's fact, a very yeah, important point. Because as UNESCO said, that, I mean, war is built in the minds of human beings, and so peace should also be created in the minds of human beings. But I want to come to this very provocative hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that Conrad had, that it is not necessary that educated people are less violent or prone to conflict. Uh, I want to ask you, Francois, uh, do you think, I mean, we've got many examples where very educated people have been very conflict prone, and people within education can also act, actually be catalysts of violence. Yes, uh, ob obviously this is uh, also possible. Um, in, uh, in this report, we identify three ways education can actually fuel conflict. Uh, the first one is not enough education, so we maintain that uh, not having enough basic education is a major problem, especially when it comes to uh, the fate of youth and having uh, large numbers of unemployed and uneducated young men in particular can be a real problem. I mean, if there's a conflict, it can fuel it. The second uh, thing is unequal education, and we, we identify a few uh, middle-income countries which have rather high uh, enrollment ratios overall, like Turkey or the Philippines, but happen to have very low enrollment in regions uh, within them which are in conflict. Um, and this is especially the case, for instance, in Mindanao in, in the Philippines or in Kurdistan in Turkey, where women uh, 
are particularly unlikely to, to go to school. And the, the last type is, the last uh, yeah, case in which education can fuel conflict is the wrong type of education. So all the issues which have to do with the imposition of uh, a language of instruction, which is not adequate, uh, which is imposing a, a majority uh, language on, on people who don't speak it. Issues to do with the teaching of religion and history and, and, and things like that. Um, but I mean, I, I would like still to insist on, on a need for basic education and the fact that there are limitations to the argument, but obviously it can do no harm if mm. you uh, ensure that all your children go to primary school. There's been, obviously, there's been a major problem with uh, the way the aid industry has uh, handled the issue. Um, for a long time, uh, technical and vocational education and training and higher education were preferred and basic education was neglected. And then in the 80s and 90s, it appeared that the returns to basic education were actually higher. And so uh, the, the way it shifted too far and now uh, higher education is being comprehensively neglected. But is the answer to start neglecting basic education again? Yeah, but you see, that's the thing. This is, again, I think uh, in, in the donor organization, there's a lot of debate about, you know, higher education versus uh, primary education. I have to tell you, uh, I was in Thailand recently, and we had discussions with Aung San Suu Kyi, and when she uh, was talking about her country, she said the focus should be on secondary education. You know, that's where uh, opinions are made and, uh, you know, attitudes are shaped. But uh, I want to ask you, talking about you know, education and peace, um, Thierry, can one really teach people peace? Well, we need to start somewhere. And um, it's not going to be a course that um, in one semester. It's a lifetime learning. Um, it's an issue of, of changing mentalities and attitudes and um, absorbing a whole new way of thinking from the violence that we, we emerged from. Um, but before I go on, I want to just touch on, on gender. I'll give you an example why gender and the focus on women, on girls, and at every level, um, young, um, young women and women are important in the educational process. Cambodia, and like many other countries in the global south, the girls are neglected in this regard and, and with regards to primary education. In Cambodia, we have 14 million. 10 million people do not have access to toilets. So imagine a young girl, she's developing, she's um, growing, and she's attending school and she has no access to, to facilities, to, um, to uh, bathroom facilities. We don't think about bathroom facilities and toilets in association with education, but where is she supposed to go when the guys and the boys can go everywhere? We're, so slowly, the girls and the dropout rate of, of the girls in the primary education, uh, educational level um, uh, are decreasing. But we don't tie toilets with education, for example. Right. So, um, but peace is, um, like I said, we have, we, we're given an, a, a great opportunity in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, in this mixed tribunal, um, to, to think about um, not only of history um, and all the different factors and, and the different um, um, countries involved in terms of history, geography, but we, we were given the space to address trauma, which is very, very much associated with peace. Because when you're traumatized, you, um, you pass that, um, 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 that on to your children, and one of the symptoms of trauma, for example, is violence. Um, we have such a high rate of domestic violence, which is the, um, the um, um, a result, uh, a symptom of our past. Of course, um, it's, it's more concentrated, it's pervasive because of the, the fact that we haven't talked about other peaceful alternatives to dealing with the angst, with the buildup, with the tension that have been um, consolidated over the years. So peace education is extremely important, but again... Um, and extremely we, tough uh, to actually implement, and it's a long-term project. It's a long-term, and we need models. We need um, in, in models in society to roam and to, to show and to have an alternative um, to the violent um, and where you, of course, you're doing exemplary side. work in that theory. At this point, I just want to ask Yana, what has our audience been saying? Have they been listening to what we are saying at all? Of, of course they have been saying. <laughs> uh, I think it's very interesting because they're agreeing with the statement from Mrs. Seng. She said earlier about the UN, and you can see that a lot of people are frustrated with how the UN is working or not working. So I think that is one of the basic things that, that are coming out of the discussion here at Twitter right now.
Right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Yana. I'm sorry. Uh, I, mean, I really respect uh, a lot of the work that the UN organizations are doing in this area. Um, obviously, there need to be modifications, and you know, but I still think they're doing fabulous work, uh, especially in this area of children and conflict. Now, we are slowly drawing to a close. At this point, um, Dr. Shetter, can I ask you, uh, what do you make of the discussion so far? Um, this is your area of research. If you just can sum up, what were the key things that you think evolved, key messages from the debate we've had so far? Well, I'm quite enthusiastic about this discussion. I could listen to it for the next two or three hours. I think one issue, uh, talking about, about peace and education, I think one argument which is often done for peace and education is just a functional one. If we, are, we know that in uh, conflicts, uh, most of the people who are going to conflicts are male between, let's say, 12 and 30 years. So just sending them to school, uh, to, to universities, is just to give them another, another thing to do uh, than, than fighting. This is a uh, usual argument which is done, why education is so important. But on the other side, uh, I would like to challenge Francois's uh, argument of, on basic education. I traveled a lot in Afghanistan and visited many schools, and what I saw there often, an example like this, that uh, people, uh, students or pupils, learn to memorize what is two plus two, it's four. But if you then ask them, count three plus one, they don't give you the answer. So the question is, what are they learning in school? So my question is, to what extent uh, just education, is, uh, this formally education, is just building up a kind of a structure of career building somehow, of formal education, where nothing is, uh, is taught. And I think here uh, Thierry's argument is quite right taken. The question of changing from, a sub, uh, from that subject to citizenship, to citizen, I think this is a tremendous question, and we have to think much more about this. And I would like to link this up to uh, Ashraf's uh, argument that if we talk about education in uh, post-conflict or even conflict societies, we have to take all the different levels of education into consideration, starting from the elementary school up to universities. If teachers are not uh, trained in how to educate in a better way, nothing will change. And I think this is, in my eyes, the tremendous uh, outcome what I learned out of this uh, conversation. Thanks, Conrad. Now, we just have a couple of minutes left in this session, and I want to use this to actually ask our panelists a question which I feel obliged to ask since I'm from the media. Do you think the media can, should play a role in promoting education in areas of conflict and crisis? Dr. Ghani, what do you think? Should the media be involved at all? 2% of men, 87% of women in Afghanistan listen to the, to the radios, at least three radio stations. So I think it's indispensable. And the, but the way the media, for instance, the BBC has a, a program in local languages, which is a series of dramas. People have learned more about world events and nature of citizen participation from those dramas than from formal schools. And Deutsche yes. Welle also has a, a program has a, called has a program. Listening by exactly. Ear, and they also actually were broadcasting for a while in Dari and Pashto. Exactly. Yeah, so you think that the media can actually media play has a, a role. Media has a very important mm -hmm. role because mm -hmm. learning is to shift from a passive mode where the, the child is the recipient to an active mode of engaging in learning. And that's the fundamental issue where the media, again, becomes very much part of the system rather than apart from it. Nicely put. Uh, Francois, you as a representative of an international organization, do you think the media should be involved in this, way, uh, as in this situation? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, uh, the, the crisis in education due to conflict is hidden, so it's, uh, the media have a, a very uh, large part to play to, uh, to show it and to bring it to the attention of the audience. Yeah. Right now, uh, I'm dying to ask about 50 million other questions, and I'm sure they have so much to tell us. But we are drawing close to the end of our session. Uh, and I think all our panelists have raised some very important issues. Um, it is a complex issue. Uh, there are many dimensions. Uh, we didn't want to simplify the issue, but we obviously couldn't deal with everything. You can continue this debate on Twitter. Um, you can also follow all our uh, plenary sessions as well as uh, videos and more information about what happened, not just at this session, but all our sessions over the past three days on the GMF website. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here, uh, for actually 
you are the die-hard GMFers, because I see a lot of people have gone. So when you give an applause to your panelists, it's also an applause for you, all of you. And I must thank all our panelists for sharing their insights, and I'm sorry we had to keep it so short. I also want to thank uh, our session organizer, Miriam Bach. Is Miriam there? Um, th there's Miriam, she was our session organizer, her and her team, I want to thank them as well. And above all, I want to thank all the participants uh, at this Global Media Forum for being part of this whole, uh, what we think is a very important and crucial event. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs> Amrita and the panel, thank you very much for setting yet another highlight uh, to the Global Media Forum. Thank you. That was absolutely splendid, wonderful, informative, and I think I'm running out of uh, very good uh, attributes uh, that I could say. Thank you very much for having been there. We are now slowly going into the closing session, so don't run away. Uh, we are, um, yes, you may leave um, if you want to. <laughs> At this stage, you've got the applause, but you, she, she can also get another round of applause. You know, applause never hurts. <laughs>